Hello, children. Thank you, Auntie Bronwyn. Hello, everybody. And welcome to Children's well, Half Hour-ish on the British Broadcasting Century podcast. It's taken the previous 68 episodes to reach April 1923 in our timeline when someone is finally put in charge of the Children's Hour. Shall we have a quick reminder of the children's story so far? Previously on the British Broadcasting Century. Children's programmes began on day two of the BBC. I was particularly interested in children and giving them good music instead of bad music and so on. So we were, I, I think we were the first people to start children's programmes from the very beginning, the 15th of November. Kenneth Wright of 2ZY Manchester. Well, that was Kiddie's Corner, but meanwhile at 5IT Birmingham, engineer A.E. Thompson became Uncle Tom with the start of the Children's Hour. I thought up the idea of a, a blue cat with yellow spots. I thought that ought to interest them. And I used to re- relate what, just what Susan had been up to during the day to the children, you see. They seemed to like that very much, except the small boys. And I started getting letters from small boys saying, Dear Uncle Tom, couldn't we have some stories about a dog, please? Because cats are for girls. I was the only woman on the staff of performers in those days. Nobody wanted to tackle speaking into the microphone. It was too terrifying. They were happy days. Broadcasting, especially children's hour, was so light-hearted and informal. Not like the highly professional work it is today. It always fell to me to give a good night to the children in Welsh. Nos dam lantos bach anoil, kaskuch and dawel. Glasgow's Auntie Kathleen, a.k.a. Auntie Cyclone, and Cardiff's Auntie Bronwyn there, including a rare bit of Welsh on the early BBC. Yes, last time we brought you the tale of Arthur Corbett Smith, the Cardiff boss who brought only smatterings of Welsh to the airwaves. Well, this time, Children's Hour becomes centralised and formalised in that there London. So we'll look not just at the early days, but at children's programming from across the century, including some more recent examples of why we love it, how it fits into and shapes our lives, and how it's there for us when we need it. We hear exclusively from children's TV presenters, producers, academics, especially Dr Amy Holdsworth of the University of Glasgow. And we hear from some of you listeners who grew up watching or listening with Mother, perhaps. Join us to look back through the square window. I mean, we're all very square on this podcast. From children's hour to bedtime hour, it's the British Broadcasting Century. Hello, hello, this is Paul Carenza calling... This is London College. Hello, children everywhere. And hello, grown-ups. Well, mostly grown-ups, that's the point of this podcast. Welcome to the slow and steady origin story of British broadcasting. We are nothing to do with the BBC, by the way. Don't think that they're involved. This time, the geekiest look imaginable at the history of children's programming on British TV and radio. It won't be a comprehensive guide. We won't drop in at every landmark moment. But we will bring you a spattering of shows from across the century. But as ever, we are anchored to a moment at the start of British broadcasting. We are finally into April of 1923. Reith's hiring spree continues with Ella Fitzgerald. Not that one. Ella Fitzgerald was put in charge of children's and then ultimately women's programmes. So in this episode, we use that as a jumping off point to look at children's programming throughout the years, especially its place in the schedules, its place in our lives. Chatting to presenters like CBB's Chris Jarvis, producers like Wide Awake Club's Nick Wilson, and Dr Amy Holdsworth has written On Living with Television, a great book that is both personal and academic. So are you sitting comfortably? Then we'll begin. Delighted to welcome to the podcast now, lecturer of film and television at University of Glasgow, an expert in these areas, and author of the book, Living with Television, Dr Amy Holdsworth. A professional telly addict. I mean, that's the dream, isn't it? You're living the dream. I am living the dream. And it probably began with a a Radio Times back in in the 80s, and a biro pen circling the programmes that you wanted to watch. And me and my dad had different coloured biros, so we knew whose selection was whose. You've got a system. That's always important. You had a system, yeah. yeah. I interviewed her far too long ago. It's over a year. I'm very embarrassed exactly how long it has taken. We had to wait for the right moment for Ella Fitzgerald to come along and centralise children's programming. So apologies, Amy. To make it up to her, do buy her book. Link in the show notes to On Living With Television. The kind of academic work I've done in publications have all been really about why television means so much. So much of uh, the culture that we live in is, can be very dismissive of television as a as a cultural form or an art form, you know. So I think it's really about partly about sort of validating the, that love of television, but also just 
thinking carefully about why it means so much and and why people are so emotionally engaged with with television in different ways as well the specificity of growing up in the UK with public service broadcasting and all the wonderful thing it does obviously it's not without its problems <laughs> but I think was really interested in its kind of duty of care but also the ways in which we use television in our everyday lives as a site of care, you know, whether that's caring for children, caring for ourselves. It's not new, obviously, a lot of kind of TV study scholars have thought about those relationships between television and the domestic space. And But I think for me, it was really about kind of focusing on, on those relationships and those dynamics of care in the home and, and how television is entangled um, within them. More from Amy shortly. And hey, your queries are always welcome on this podcast. And I've had a genuine query from genuinely one of our newest listeners, my son. He has started listening. I've not told him to, I promise. So uh, welcome. Join us on Patreon. Actually, don't. My credit card is not to be touched, you hear, boy? Now, my son asks, though, a genuine question. He wanted to know, when was the first child on the BBC? Great question. Great episode to answer it, because thankfully, we do have an easy answer. The first child on the BBC was day two, November the 15th, 1922. It was Reginald Jordan, and here he is. I think I was about 10 or 11 years old. Kenneth Wright, the station director, was Uncle Humpty Dumpty. Uh, another of our friends was the Sandman, who used to sing the children to sleep. And I rejoiced in the name of Dinko, the foreman of the Pixies. Reginald Jordan, then a young child, on the air as the BBC began, was particularly shocked by a couple of announcers. He later remembered, I was horror-struck one Saturday when in the middle of Kiddies Corner I heard a tipsy voice say, Hello, hick, kiddies. Uncle Bod calling. Uncle Bod calling. Yes, the uncle was merry on Boddington's Ale. Another early uncle forgot to flick the switch when he finished one of his talks. He said goodnight to the kids and then on air was heard to say, That's finished with the little buggers till Monday, thank God. Oh, and for my son who's listening, don't let me hear you use language like that. As well as literally putting children on the air, early Children's Hour presenters and producers were eager to know then what young listeners thought of the programmes to make it their show. Percy Edgar and A.E. Thompson in Birmingham originated the Children's Hour in week three of the BBC. Here's Uncle Tom himself with an ingenious plan to help the children's correspondence flow more freely. We had the bright idea of getting the children to write letters to us and tell us what they thought about the programme. And... uh, We soon began to receive hundreds of letters, of course, and it was quite a job sorting them out. Then we had another brainwave, and I said to Percy Edgar one evening, uh, I said, Edgar, Uncle Edgar, I I like this pink notepaper, don't you? And he said, well, I prefer blue notepaper, really. Oh, I said, do you? Oh, no. I said, I prefer my letters on pink notepaper. Oh, no, he said, I like mine on blue. Well, believe it or not, after that, we used to always have two piles of letters, and one was always pink and the other was always blue. (laughs) So we knew at once there was no sorting required. We we knew which letters were intended for Uncle Edgar and which for Uncle Tom. (laughs) Very clever. Very soon, children's letters were used to help map the listenership as to where the letters came from. If you get correspondence, use it wisely. So these aunts and uncles were hugely popular, so influential, in fact, that my new novel, coming soon, is called Auntie and Uncles. It'll be out uh, later this year. Bit delayed, sorry. It's largely due to the podcast. Turns out it's a lot of work to do all of this research for a podcast and a book and a live show at the same time. Oh, live show, by the way, paulcarenza.com slash tour. You can see where I'm bringing a live show about early radio to Guildford, Romsey, Chelmsford, Turnham Green, and possibly other places if you would like to book me. paulcarenza.com slash tour for details of shows including Guildford on June the 24th, recreating the first religious broadcast, and an hour of early radio in Guildford on July the 1st. Do join me. Anyway, back with those first aunts and uncles. London ran with the Children's Hour concept, famously bringing us Uncle Arthur Burroughs, Uncle Caractacus, Cecil Lewis, Uncle Rex Palmer. Early material was written for them by Mrs Harmon Earl for free. Author of Behind the Wireless, A History of Early Women at the BBC, Dr Kate Murphy. I love the idea that in London, it was Arthur Burroughs and Cecil Lewis, who were the, like the two main, you know, the senior managers, mucking about as uh, Uncle Arthur and Uncle Caractacus. <laughs> they were doing the children's hour initially, 
They should probably bring that back. You know, whenever they get these new DGs in from from politics nowadays, they should say you can be director general, but you've also got to go on the children's program every day and do a story. You know, and uh, bring them back down to to ground level. Because I, I I'm I'm not used to st- telling stories to children at all. And the engineers were were, were doing children's readings and things. A. E. Thompson talking about. Well, I thought I'd try some children's readings. Yeah, and you could hear in his voice he's he's so lacking confidence about. It. He said, well, I don't know how to read to children. I don't know what I'm doing. And I think in Arthur Burroughs' book, a slight sense of loss that those early days when they could just turn up with a random book and some Stanton Jeffries on the piano. One cannot recall those early days without smiling. And then when it was more scripted and more centralised, I think certainly someone like Burroughs pretty much might have felt that something was lost a little bit from those early, completely free winning days. So different from those simple beginnings 14 years ago, when I sometimes closed the night's programme with these lines from Longfellow. The night shall be filled with music. But it had to change to grow, I suppose. By this point, the BBC is growing exponentially and and needed that. Absolutely, and exponentially is the word, you know. It is just growing and growing and growing and growing. But it isn't a very good, it is not a very good use of senior managers, ultimately, to to be doing that every day, you know. (laughs) It was all very localised then. London had their way, Cardiff, Newcastle, Birmingham, Manchester, Glasgow, they all had theirs. And each station then had their own mob of uncles, aunts and cousins. Here's Auntie Broadwin of Cardiff to show off her crew. Today we're going to take another wonderful trip on the magic carpet. This time we're going to ask you to take us to New York. And here it is waiting for us. It's going to be very crowded today because all the aunts and uncles and cousins are coming with us. Now, all aboard. That's right. Hold tight, everybody. We're off. Perhaps the first to be called a radio aunt among the uncles, that may have been Auntie Gladys in Birmingham in March 1923, or possibly Aunt Sophie Cecil Dixon joining the London team. But still, no one in charge of it then at HQ, until April 1923, when the first person to give in charge of Children's Hour was Peter Eckersley. What? Yes, as well as being chief engineer and radio pioneer, Peter Pendleton Eckersley was put temporarily in charge of it. This from Popular Wireless magazine. I'm glad to learn from Captain Eckersley, who is now in charge of the Children's Hour from all the broadcasting stations, that he intends to thoroughly reorganise this part of the evening programmes. I understand that both the Tiny Tots and the older kiddies will be catered for, and that the items will be more varied in nature. The material for these will be distributed to the various stations in advance. A little like the laundry basket we told you about on previous episodes, then you could tour the same programme across the land on different days by just sending it station to station. Scripts, music, even performers. Peter Eckersley's brother Roger would years later have the task of reforming Children's Hour as head of programmes, but that would be some time away yet. For now, Peter Eckersley is a temporary sticking plaster over Reith's bigger problem, his plan to centralise, to take power away from the local stations. <clears throat> yes, I'm talking about 1923 and I don't know what you mean. So, Peter Eckersley is holding the fort for Children's Hour. Until some new hirings come in, uh, April the 2nd, Ralph Wade is appointed, given charge of talks, although this wouldn't fully be its own department until Hilda Matheson arrives a few years later, becoming the first director of talks. For now, it's just about who has jurisdiction for what. So Ralph Wade, he gets talks three days later, April the 5th, Ella Fitzgerald is hired. Again, not the singer. This is someone different. What an unhelpful name to have yeah, yeah. I know if you put Ella Fitzgerald BBC into the internet I mean mm-hmm. it doesn't help at all really so Mrs Ella Fitzgerald comes in April 1923 so they're already they will just be in in Savoy Hill by that point and I'd love to know more about her she just is so interesting and so important I do know that she was born in Guinea I think her dad had a mine or something in South America so she was born there and came over to England. She was obviously a journalist, a Fleet Street journalist. She is then the first central organiser of Children's Hour. That includes actually scripting the programmes and sending them out to the stations. Local autonomy be gone. A month later, Ella Fitzgerald initiated and headed up Women's Hour, not Woman's Hour. We'll have another episode on that soon enough. The children and their broadcasting was her first priority. So she comes in to, to do the Women's Hour and the Children's Hour. These are ideas of Cecil Lewis again. So Cecil Lewis has had these ideas for Men's Hour and Women's Hour. Children's Hour is already, already going. And then he has this idea. These three programmes, Ella Fitzgerald comes in to kind of to oversee Women's Hour and Children's Hour. 
but very, very quickly, someone, I think it's Auntie Geraldine or someone comes in and takes over L- London Children's Hour, but she has this kind of overall responsibility. And Scotland's pretty big, so there's Kathleen Garthgadden is Auntie Kathleen up in Scotland. We just went out and bought music every day for the programmes, brought it in, put fairy tale books on the piano and seized a book and just read. Well, I, I saw that the things were suitable, of course. I had a wee look at them beforehand, but everything was just done on the spur of the moment, I think there weren't any rehearsals just to begin with. And he's also a bit more like Ella Fitzgerald because Scotland has much more status, obviously, being a big, big country. And on Glasgow 5SC, his author of Scotland on Air, Graham Stewart. Children's Hour played a large part in the early life of all the broadcasting stations. It was a particularly haphazard affair. So at half past five every evening, literally everyone who worked for the station, and that included... On occasion, the station commissioner, Charlie Gordon, and even Jim the office boy, they would all gather in the studio. I went to buy my grand a quarter of dolly mixtures, an umbrella, a handbag. And contribute to, I think, what was probably the most spontaneous programme of all. <laughs> <laughs> a scarf, um, a pot of shampoo, a pot of strawberry jam, and... Skipping rope. <laughs> oh, very good. Well, I think that'll lead. I think we can't go on any longer. We've done awfully well. And it was just lovely playing that game. I wish we could have gone on for ages. I mean, personally, I should forget everything. Glasgow's auntie Kathleen Garskadden ran a tight ship. If the children's story finished before the hour, she'd be literally dragging every staff member she could find, those who weren't hiding, into the studio so these aunts and uncles could play a quick children's game before the news. On more than one occasion, she recalled the early programmes as amateurish. Nobody seemed much perturbed. And they all seem pretty well pleased with what's done. That said, though, um, the Children's Hour did become hugely popular. And Kathleen Garskadden, at the head of this programme, became massively popular among children listening to the radio. And they got involved as well. I mean, there were weekly singing lessons at the microphone. They set up a radio circle choir. There was a children's corner club. They would arrange outings for the children. Uh, Members of the public would arrive at Bath Street waiting for the children's hour personalities to leave the building because people wanted to see what they looked like. Children's hour became more disciplined from December 1923. Ella Fitzgerald found it all rather too informal and haphazard, especially in the regions where the rigour of Arthur Burroughs and other head office staff weren't keeping them all in check. There's a directive that says that each station must employ a woman of personality, education and standing. Dr Kate Murphy. Because again, all the local radio stations will presumably have, similar to London, have their chat you know, the kind of management chaps doing this children's hour thing with, with odd aunties and things coming in. But they need, they need someone to kind of run it. And so each local station gets a woman assistant and they are, you know, they are educated. These women come in and I think some people like Dorothy Barcroft, Ruby Barlow in, in Nottingham, these women are coming in to take on this role. Ella Fitzgerald in London then has a more sort of supervisory role. So as Ella Fitzgerald centralised the children's hours, finding suitable material and performers, her staff grew. So Auntie Geraldine, off air, was called Miss E. Elliot, and she worked as Ella Fitzgerald's assistant at Savoy Hill. Miss R. May looked after the clerical work. Increasingly, there were set times of programmes, greater preparation needed. The children loved these shows, and importantly, parents loved them too. So that fixture in the schedules helped families know how to structure the end of the day. Bedtime can be a moment of real tension in the home. Dr Amy Holdsworth, author of On Living with Television. Kids aren't always easy to put to bed. Mm. (laughs) Sociologists have written about bedtime or a moment of heightened anxieties for, for a child. That transition between different spaces in the house, potentially, that from going from being with a group of people to being on your own, those fears around falling asleep, am I going to wake up? What What if I have nightmares? You know, so it can be a real, really fraught time of the day. And there's also those questions around legitimate authority and um, children kind of pushing back against parents going, I refuse to go to bed. You can't make me go to bed. Mm. You know, so there's those kind of tussles that happen. Bedtime rituals are really interesting, both in terms of bedtime storybooks and those kind of longer histories of reading um, to children at bedtime. And it's obviously something that CBB's Bedtime Hour taps into as well. 
From 1924, head office was taking it all rather seriously. Linking the previous episode of the podcast and this one, how about this from Arthur Corbett Smith? By this point, he's left Cardiff. He's come to London, where he's feeding back internally on all sorts of programmes, including The Children's Corner, being the first in a series of chats by the artistic director upon various aspects of broadcast programme work. On the Children's Hour, it is of the first importance that the ideals, principles and functions of the Children's Hour be kept constantly in mind. The primary function of the hour may be summed up in the expression, the building of character, and all that such connotes. To adopt a tone of superiority or aloofness is to court immediate disaster and ridicule. This was the first real guidance on how to present this to children. Thanks to Dr Zara Healy for her work in finding this, and we'll link in the show notes if you want to read more of Arthur Corbett Smith's thoughts on children's broadcasting. Buffoonery and noisy ensemble talking must not be permitted. Well, you can see the last episode for details of how Reith sent Corbett Smith packing. But in 1926, Reith also sent male station bosses packing from fronting this children's hour. They were required to run stations and not be on air as uncles. Around this time, then, well, how about a poem from Enid Blyton? This is from 1925. It's called Our Wireless. Daddy's bought a wireless set, the very nicest he could get, and every evening after tea, baby boy and Jane and me put receivers on our head and listen till we go to bed. And although I like to listen in, especially when the tales begin, I wish and wish, for goodness sake, that wireless set of ours would break. For Mummy then would smile and say, I'll tell you stories, dear, today. She used to read to Jane and me such lovely stories after tea. She'd sometimes laugh and sometimes smile and cuddle baby all the while. But now, until we go to bed, the wireless tells us tales instead. And oh, if you could come one day and take our wireless set away, I'd be as glad as glad could be, and perhaps invite you after tea to hear our mummy tell again her lovely tales to me and Jane. From 1925. So when you hear of today's smart speakers taking care of bedtime reading, and what a shame it is removing the personal touch, Enid Blyton thought that 98 years ago. Through the 1920s, Children's Hour shifted leadership. Ella Fitzgerald moved purely to focus on women's programmes. So jurisdiction for children's broadcasting, well, that first went to Uncle Rex Palmer and then Uncle Peter, a.k.a. C.E. Hodges, and then Uncle Columbus, Alan Howland, in 1929. All still uncles in charge of Children's Hour, even HQ. Moving into the 1930s, Uncle Mac famously took over Children's Hour for nearly 20 years by the 1950s, it became clear that lots of those listening now weren't children anymore. They were people who were children, like we all were. I, I'd not connected with bedtime hour and children's hour, which, of course, came in very early on, the first few weeks. So we still, that's a common thread, isn't there, between 100 years ago and now in that uh, provision, I suppose. Absolutely. I think so. I think that scheduling for a particular audience, you know, so whether that's the children's hour or whether it's, um, you know, Watch With Mother, which was the first kind of preschool strand on TV, you know, that, that these were carefully scheduled around the rhythms of um, the child's life in the home, you know, whether that's just after school or just before the older kids come home from school. The, the famous example is The Toddler's Truce, which ran until 1957, uh, when broadcasting closed down between 6 and 7 p.m., um, and the idea of that was it would help parents and carers get their children to bed. So it'd be a cue for bedtime. So rather than the, having the distractions of the TV, they could they could focus on getting getting the children to bed instead. So that's a kind of really, um, I think, a really powerful example of the well, of the power of broadcasting and the power of, of the state at that point to govern the temporal schedules of, of people's lives in the home. And, and obviously all wrapped up in discourses around effective parenting and, and also the, the idea of protecting innocent minds from the corruptions of adult television. So I think it's a, a really fascinating example in, in the history of broadcasting in the UK. The Children's Hour title was then dropped in 1961. The slot itself was dropped in 1964. Television was taking over. And of course, that includes children's television. With memories of it, his listener and grandson of broadcasting pioneer H.J. Round, it's David Jervis. I have such fond memories of Watch With Mother, which began in the early 1950s, featuring such legendary programmes as Bill and Ben, Andy Pandy and Ragtag and Bobtail. But my favourite was The Wooden Tops, featuring Spotty Dog. Many years later, in my 40s and beyond, 
I would delight friends and colleagues with my imitation of the unforgettable spotty dog. But not all of our listeners have fond memories of Andy Pandy. Here is Andrew Barker. My first memories of television were Watch With Mother and watching Bill and Ben and The Wooden Tops and Andy Pandy. But I hated Andy Pandy. He seemed very much a very soft kid, a wimp, and forever from that point onwards, I refused to let anyone call me Andy. It always had to be Andrew. Listener Charles Huff remembers Sooty on the radio. One quick little story of why I love radio. Midweek, introduced by Libby Purvis, and lots of intellectuals and authors and what have you used to appear there. It was a reasonably upmarket programme. One of the guests was Matthew Corbett, who just recently taken over from his father, Harry Corbett, as a man with Sooty. And Sooty called his little glove puppet. And Matthew Corbett gave a very good interview, very interesting, but before he did it, he did a little Sooty show. And of course, one has to recall that Sooty made no noise whatsoever. Sooty used to communicate with his whoever he's with by whispering in the ear of the person. And this is radio. So to make this work, Matthew Corbett had to get the various intellectuals, authors and what have you around the table to shout out things like, come out of the box sooty, which they did with great uh, exuberance. And sitting at home, I thought, this is utterly ridiculous and totally wonderful. And here is someone with a long history producing children's television from Wide Awake Club to Channel 5's Milkshake, Nick Wilson. Nick's way in was the later years of Play School. I started out on Play School where I was allowed to make really exotic sets, but they all had to be made out of cardboard boxes. Really? I did an interview for, for, for what the BBC loosely called a training attachment, mm. and uh, the wonderful Cynthia Felgay, who was the executive producer of Play School at that time, said to me, what sort of programmes would you like to make? And I said, ones with things that make noises. And she said, what sort of noises? And I said, well, a tap. She said, well, be a tap then. So I had to be a tap. You had to be a tap. I had to be a tap. So I must have been a really good tap because right. I got the job. See. It was a tap that creaked and spluttered. and <laughs> Really? Did you like that? Yeah, yeah. So you were a tap. So there. I was a tap. Wow. Um, I had a colleague who got a job for an even better reason. He mm. got a job because he went into the interview, took his jacket off and hung it up on a door which didn't have a hook. Right. He then proceeded <laughs> to exit through a cupboard. Oh, no. So, um, but there. he got the job too. So that's why Play School was like it was. It was and we, we can thank you since then. Then for the Wide Awake Club. Yeah. And Wackaday. And Wackaday. And Dapple Down Farm. Dapple Down, really? Yes. Yeah, Dappled, and sorts. Milkshake on 5, or Tribal Channel 5, I don't quite know which. which. Channel C5. C5. Channel C5. Five. I, I, I got the gig on Milkshake mm. on Channel 5 when it launched by um, having a weak bladder. Because I went and did this speech at BAFTA at a dinner and it went down quite well. And I was bursting for a leak. So I went to the very mm. illustrious BAFTA Lose and I'm standing there. Two spare urinals on either side. And two men in overcoats came either side of me. Would like to come and see us tomorrow? Oh. oh all right. But anyway, there were two of the guys who were putting together the bid for Channel 5, the Thames friend. And, wow. and I went to see them the next day and they said, uh, apparently we need somebody to run kids. Right. Oh, really? <laughs> so, <laughs> you look like the man. Yeah. But anyway, okay. we had a chat. And, and yeah. yes, so I got the gig and I was wow. it was my first real experience of being... The only person doing children's programming, whereas my next door neighbour mm. was doing late night news and porn. Right. <laughs> and my other neighbour was doing what was loosely described as entertainment. Mm. I do remember there was that sort of moment where Channel 5 said, we're going to do more children's programmes and more adult programmes, so to speak. It was, it was an interesting time mm. when I, I used to get asked quite often during my first few years there, as, what was it like? Mm trying to make children's programmes acceptable on a channel that did the three Fs the rest of the time. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, no, I'm not going to say what the three Fs are. Yeah, yeah, we can work yeah, that out. But, yeah, uh, yeah. Yeah. but it worked. Nobody expected it to be mm. hugely successful. They thought it was a low-budget contribution to the public service remit. And mm. I was given freedom, mm. and I'd never had this sort of freedom before. No mm. money, but freedom. Mm. Well, in fact, I remember my first ever, my TV work experience was via you, in fact, at the children's channel. Back in 1990, <laughs> um, something like that. And it, so thank you for that. We are whizzing through, we're missing lots out. But let's now look at the CBeebies era. Children, and indeed parents, had a whole channel to themselves to inform, educate and entertain the youngest of viewers. Dr Amy Holdsworth. I think the example of CBeebies is really interesting to me because I think it's a really 
tangible example of how television can be instrumentalised and be useful for parents and guardians um, and carers as well. It has that a kind of mode of address that's it's for both preschoolers, but it's also for parents and carers too. How that then informs our kind of domestic lives and our kind of rituals and routines in our own lives as well. When our youngest was born and we sat down and we first discovered In the Night Garden, which I know you, you mm. write about at length in, uh, in the book here, same time every day and not just in the evening, end of the day, but lunch, you know, midday naps and things like that. But the, mm. the, the, the cycles and the repetitive elements of those shows with mm. Eagle Piggles not in bed and all those sorts of things. Yes, um, yeah. Ragdoll Productions, that are obviously behind Teletubbies, also made in the Night Garden. I mean, they're so carefully researched. And it's so beautiful, actually, when, when you sit down and look at In the Night Garden, at what it's doing and how it's specifically designed to alleviate those anxieties. One of the features you're noticing in the night garden, if you, if you're a viewer of it, <laughs> is that pattern of retreat and return. You know, so Eagle Piggle, you know, goes across the sea to the night garden and then he sort of comes back at the end as well. So it's going away for an adventure, but also coming back to the safety of the bedroom at the end of the day. And that's what you, you know, you find that in where the wild things are. You also see it in Jim Henson's pajam, pajamas, pajamas, which I can never say. The sort of toy child characters, you know, they go, they fly off on their beds to have an adventure and then they come back and have a have a, have a good night's sleep once they've worked through the, the particular set of anxieties that they have in, in that particular episode. So I think it's a really beautiful, um, really beautiful programme in the Night Garden. But it's really funny to teach with it because I, I use it in teaching when, you know, I've got I've sort of like 19, 20 year olds. <laughs> who are just completely confounded by it. And they're, <laughs> and they're like, it's so long and it's so repetitive and it's so boring. And you're just like, well, it's not actually for you. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, I think it's always, it's always fun to teach with. I've got, I've, got a, I've got a copy here of John York's book, Into the Woods, uh, when I, I lectured mm-hmm. screenwriting at Winchester yes. Uni. And that, that whole thing about the five act structure and you start off at home and then you go into the woods, you have the adventure, you return mm-hmm. home changed. You know, you go back to hero's journey and uh, all this mythology stuff. But uh, yeah, of course, I, in the night gardens doing it, they're all doing it, aren't they? With that return, yes. retreat, and they go away, they have an adventure. They, but you've got to see them come back. You've got to see them come home again. Yeah. And then while they're having their adventure, there's all sorts of like little skills that they're learning about call and response, about problem solving about kind of the kind of pro-social goals of, of kind of children's television as well. And then you also see the characters in the, the series itself. They're read a bedtime story in the episode itself, and then they're put to bed and they're the Iggle Piggles gently coaxed by Derek Jacobi to, you know, <laughs> to chill out and lie down. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, and then and then everyone off goes off to bed at the end at the end of the show. I remember distinctly putting our youngest to bed for a midday nap. In fact, he fell asleep halfway through the episode. I put him to bed. I came back, and I had to finish watching in the night garden just to see what happened. And I was, <laughs> there was no child in the room, but I was thinking, yeah. no, I need to complete it. I need to complete yeah. the sequence. But I think that's again, that's one of the interesting things about uh, uh, preschool TV is the those that kind of intergenerational appeal. You know, so there's so much in the night garden that has these kind of nostalgic appeal, appeals to um you know an adult audience so from the blossom the cherry blossom you see at the start you know which recalls the title cards from watch with mother to the bandstand you know sort of the magic roundabout to the the little ponty pines which are really reminiscent of the kind of small films it's not just about making television for early years kids but it's about convincing the parents as well that this is television that they should be watching with or allowing their children to watch it and I think, you know, nostalgia in children's TV is really interesting as well. I think the way in which we introduce our our own children, I mean, I don't have my own children, I've got a niece and a nephew, but the way in which those those cycles of uh, nostalgia cycles work in children's media, this idea that we, we want them to enjoy the things that we grew up with as well. This idea of that we can have this kind of connection with with our children through the kind of media that we consumed um, when we were little. So you get things obviously like the clangers returning over the last sort of five years or so, and I think and then obviously a, a really big example of that intergenerationality is the use of celebrities to read the um, bedtime story. A, a little you know eighteen month old isn't going to know who Dave Grohl is, but <laughs> <That> is <true. laughs> 
<laughs> yeah. So, so who's that yeah. for at the end of the day? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, totally. Presenting from day one of CBBS until now was Chris Jarvis. Now, in terms of who we're thinking about and what we're thinking about, which differs from years ago, is whereas before we used to compete with ITV and then Nickelodeon, all these other channels, we're not really anymore because the, the real competition is, is just about everything. <laughs> what children watch, you know, <laughs> on YouTube and play games. We can thank you, is that right, for bringing Bernard Cribbins' storytelling on Old Jack's boat back to our TVs, is that correct? A few, yeah, a few years ago, my dad, because because I write songs as well for children's TV and Panto, and a few years ago, my dad helped me write a song called Old Tom's Boat, which became Old Jack's Boat, um, teaching kids about colours. And it was all about a fisherman on, on his boat called the Rainbow that was really magical. And um, and Poi, who I work with, Poi Fan Lee, who used to be Poe in the Teletubbies, by the way, um, she, um, her son, Bruno, as he was growing up, loved the song and we, we had to listen to it all the time in the car. Anyway, we got thinking, oh, this would make a, a TV programme, you know, about an old fisherman on his boat. And I'd worked with Bernard and I was friends with Bernard Cribbins for a long time and, you know, chatted to him. Would you do it? Da, 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 da. Anyway, it developed into a program we wrote it all up and uh, submitted it to the BBC and and they went with it and it became Rockpool Tales and it's been reformatted a few times in actual fact Rockpool Tales is the closest to, to what we originally pitched you can hear more from Chris Jarvis including a heartfelt defense of preschool children's broadcasting and local radio way back on episode 10 of this podcast as for children's radio there is still such a thing today it's CBBS radio that is a corner of the BBC that I certainly know about I've written a series for it Granny Ann's Joke World starring Maureen Lippman written by me is on CBBS radio seek it out kids I'll put the link in the show notes. But of course, it's children's television, especially preschooler stuff that has a magic effect on children today. I've only written one bit for children's television. That was Andy and the Band on CBBC. But it's still a joy to hear the feedback of children who have seen, enjoyed, and remember those episodes far longer than I have. Children's broadcasting in the UK has such a wonderful, rich history. And it's really been a, a really progressive site in, in many senses. If you think about the emphasis on diversity and equality inclusion that we have nowadays. Children's TV has been doing things that for years that we have never seen on adult for adults. You know, particularly in relation to, to thinking about things like disability. Think about how wonderful something special is as a programme and how it really thinks carefully about how it caters for its diverse child audiences that you, I can't think really think of an equivalent in kind of adult programming. And it's about being like a kind of trusted brand as well. That's partly why CBeebies does so much with its kind of adult audience. You know, mm. it's about parents and carers feeling they can trust the channel with their children and with the pandemic. There are so many really clear examples of, of where the BBC was able to provide you know, extra content, you know, whether that was for children or religious programming and, and to provide those broadcast community or, or an online community that, that was suddenly taken away from everybody. I think it was really quite fantastic. But that centralisation of children's programming began a hundred and a bit years ago with Ella Fitzgerald as that new head of Children's Hour in April 1923. And we'll continue in that month next time. There's trouble for Reith as he takes on both the government and the press the week after Ella Fitzgerald arrives. So we've got more academic insight next episode of the podcast from Patrick Barwise and Peter York, authors of The War Against the BBC, how an unprecedented combination of hostile forces is destroying Britain's greatest cultural institution and why you should care. That is the title. You should get that book. You should also get On Living with Television by Dr Amy Holdsworth. And Behind the Wireless, a history of early women at the BBC by Dr Kate Murphy. Thanks to them and thanks to all our guests, David Jervis, Charles Huff, Andrew Barker, Chris Jarvis, Nick Wilson, Drs Holdsworth and Murphy and Graham Stewart for you. After all that, it's time for bed. Oh, uh, there's a bit of extra time before we finish. So what would Kathleen Garscadden do? Conduct us in a bit of singing before we leave? Well, our children, let's have that chorus once more. Here we sit like birds in a wilderness. You all ready? The British Broadcasting Century is presented and produced solely by me, Uncle Paul Carenza. Original music is by Uncle Will Farmer. We try to only use clips that are so old they're far beyond the realms of copyright, but any BBC content is used with kind permission of Auntie. 
BBC copyright content reproduced courtesy of the British Broadcasting Corporation. All rights reserved. Do support us on Patreon if you enjoy the podcast. Patreon.com slash Paul Carenza is where you can find extra bits and pieces in return for a fiver a month. It all helps fund this giant project of broadcasting's backstory. Stay informed, educated and entertained. And join us next time for the Beeb versus the press versus the government. Mm, sound familiar? We're talking about 1923 at the other end of this British broadcasting century. Good night, children, everywhere. Good night, children. Good night.